Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer, and it's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show, brought to you by Wondrium. You know Wondrium, a series of college-level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by The Teaching Company. Wondrium brings you engaging educational content through short-form videos, long-form courses, tutorials, how-to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, and more, covering every topic you've ever wondered about, and many probably you've never thought you would wonder about. That's kind of the fun of it. I, I often uh, just you know pop up the the app on my phone and just scroll through to see what comes up that might interest me. Here's one I'm going to tackle in the next week. Secrets of the Occult. So this includes, as you can tell, as the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, I have some interest in the occult and supernatural. What is the occult? Here, I'm just going to riff, riff, uh, rifle through some of these 24 lectures each, 30 minutes each. The occult in the ancient world, talking to the dead. Look, anybody can talk to the dead. Getting the dead to talk back, that's the hard part. <laughs> Let's see how they deal with that one. We'll see about that. Practical magic, love, money, and health. Yes, that is what psychics and astrologers and tarot card readers and palm readers want to ask you about because everybody is concerned about love, money, health, and career also. Uh, so you can't go wrong with that. The cult in the ancient world I mentioned. Uh, vampires, werewolves, and zombies. Ooh, cool. Religious faith in the occult. Ah, now that will interest me. Crime in the occult. I wonder if Charles Manson will, uh, or the Nazis will feature in this one. We'll see. The occult in the Ref Russian Revolution. Oh, of course, that's you know who that was advising the czar, Rasputin. Ah, here we go. Hitler, Nazism, and the occult. Yes, there's a whole lecture on that. The occult in the Soviet Union. Uh, witchcraft in the occult. The occult enlightenment. American occultism. Oh, boy, I'm definitely listening to this one. In fact, I'm going to start this today on my bike ride. All right, so here's the deal. If you um, subscribe to Wondrium uh, through the podcast, you get half off in your first quarter. Uh, subscription. That is the first three months. You get 50% off if you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Shermer, you know, S-H-E-R-M-E-R. Wondrium.com slash Shermer. Check it out. You get 50% off your subscription rate for the first three months. And why would you not want to do this? It's just an amazing source of content to consume. All right. This episode is brought to you by Ren. Let me tell you about that. You know, other than the direct donations to support the show through skeptic.com. Um, we are very selective about who uh, we allow to advertise on the show. It's only companies whose mission is aligned with ours. And Ren is one of those. It's simple yet elegant in its concept. Ren is a website where you can calculate your personal carbon footprint based on your lifestyle and then offset it by funding the rights the right projects, which includes planting trees, protecting the rainforest, and sequestering CO2 gases and more. So what I want you to do is go to ren.co, W-R-E-N.co slash Shermer, and if you sign up, they'll plant 10 extra trees in your name. I mean, how cool is that? Just go there right now, W-R-E-N.co slash S-H-E-R-M-E-R, and you'll get 10 trees planted in your name. I'm not kidding. I wouldn't, if this was a, uh, if this wasn't true, I wouldn't, uh, advertise them on the show. So, uh, check it out. It's, um, a, a, a website where you can do a lot more than, of course, just that calculate your carbon footprint by filling out this form. I did it. Mine is, uh, you know, kind of medium. Um, I'm not a super massive, uh, fossil fuel user and, and so forth. My carbon footprint isn't huge, but it's not as low as I would like it. So I subscribed so they can offset it by some of their measures. So it's a realistic approach uh, to this issue of climate science. You can't eliminate your carbon emissions completely, obviously, right off the bat, but you can offset them. And I, I am in favor of technological solutions to climate change issues. And uh, so REN is one of those companies doing something about that. So check it out. Go to wren.co slash slash Shermer, S-H-E-R-M-E-R, W-R-E-N dot C-O slash Shermer, and you can start making a difference. All right, thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting this a great company, and here's the episode. My guest today is, let me give him a proper introduction, 
He is Stefan Alexander, professor of theoretical physics at Brown University, an established jazz musician, and an immigrant from Trinidad who grew up in the Bronx. He is the 2020 president of the National Society of Black Physicists and a founding faculty director of Brown University's Presidential Scholars Program, which boosts underrepresented, underrepresented students. In addition to his academic achievements, he was the scientific consultant to Ava DuVernay's uh, Wrinkle in Time. I love that. I love the book. <laughs> i got to see that film. His work has been featured by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Wired, and many other outlets, and he's been a guest on Nova, the Brian Lehrer Show, and Neil deGrasse Tyson's Star Talk, among much else. He's the author of The Jazz of Physics and his new book. Here it is. It's called Fear of a Black Universe, An Outsider's Guide to the Future of Physics. Nice to see you, Stefan. How are you doing? Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, it's great to see you again, Michael, and great to be on your show. Oh, boy. Well, to get started here, first let me note that um, it's, a, it's a really beautifully written book and beautifully read. I, I listen to most of my guest books on audio when I'm out riding my bike or driving my car or walking with my dog, and you've got a great audio voice. It's just such a good, you're a good, good pacer on, on reading uh, your own work, and I like that because then I know the author has close connection to the words, so I really yeah. appreciated that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's start with the give us your give us your little potted biography. How do you go from Trinidad to the Bronx to the almost pinnacle of theoretical physics, which is pretty cool? Yeah. Well, um, like most, um, I think most immigrants that come to the U.S., um, there's probably some family connection and or community connection. And the part of Bronx that I grew up in in the '80s um, was one of you know had a a, 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 a you know, a Caribbean community um, embedded in an Italian community in the Bronx, a little Italy, um, and, which was great fun growing up around. Uh, and um, yeah, so because of that, you know, there was an opportunity for uh, my parents move mainly so that we can have educational opportunities. Uh, that was the main reason. They were a fairly comfortable middle class family in Trinidad. Um, and, you know, we took advantage of that, you know, definitely, um, you know, um, Education was a big deal, and I uh, found my passion in physics at, at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. Um, had some great teachers. New York City is a great place in, a, in that sense, right? Because, you know, you have a lot of people who also come to the city, uh, who also immigrated to the city with aspirations, maybe to become a number theorist or a physicist or a jazz musician, and they end up becoming high school teachers um, because, you know, life situation calls them there, and I end up we end up being their students. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Is there somebody, something in particular that uh, nudged you toward the physical sciences and then theoretical physics, a professor or a teacher, a book, documentary, something that, you know, kind of really tagged you? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, th there was a whole set of conditions that when I think about it, um, and every time I realize there's something new, um, well, I grew up in, you know, during a time uh, I was growing up in the Bronx, which was, again, early 80s um, um, to late 80s as an adolescent. Um, Hip-hop music was being developed, um, and that, that culture was really congealing in the Bronx. And that was, it was a very creative time. People were making things up, figuring out how to, like, for example, some of the guys in my high school invented um, the way of doing digital sampling for the hip-hop beats. And so there's a lot of innovation in that sense, um, you know, there's for, for a lot of autodidactic things going on, people teaching themselves to do things. Um, so it was very much in the culture. But then I had great, a great math and physics teacher who were, they were just very enthusiastic. And they also went outside of the curriculum. So, you know, we had a traditional curriculum in the New York City public school, but they would like Mr. Fader and Daniel Fader, who was also a rabbi um, and a, a, a number theorist on the side would, you know, it's okay, I know you're supposed to learn these trick identities, but let me show you where it really comes from. And he would go all into all this number theory stuff. It was just the enthusiasm, right? And then Mr. Kaplan, my high school physics teacher, who was also a jazz musician, right? So, you know, my very first, um, you know, mentor um, is also a musician. And so there was never any issue in, in, for me to do both if I, you know, if I chose that path. So it was just a great place. I mean, there were challenges, obviously, but um, I look back at, at, at that situ at that time of my life um, in the Bronx as a place where I learned a lot of tricks of the trade. 
Yeah, you have a lot of references to your various mentors in the book. I mean, you really were hanging out with the who's who in, in theoretical physics and cosmology for those decades. That must have been pretty very, cool. I mean, it was just so like, I mean, I don't even want to call this thing serendipity because, you know, this is, you're a skeptic, you know, this is about the skeptic. So there's no <laughs> such thing as serendipity, right? <laughs> but it did feel that way. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it does sometimes feel like a, a conjuncture of events without uh, preordained plans do change the world. I mean, change people's lives. That happens all the time. Right. And uh, I, I can imagine that that happened to you with these different people you met. You have a scene in your in your book up in a read in which you reference our mutual friend, Brian Keating. Uh, this is in the context of, uh, of you discussing uh, in part what it's like to be uh, black in a in a in America or in in, in physics and, and so on and some of the issues you've had to deal with there. So here's your scene too. You call it after a few months into my second postdoc, I stopped going to my office to work. The dozen or so postdocs in the theory group were very very interactive. However, time after time, I found my attempts to interact with my peers were not reciprocated and were ignored, even ignored. One day, a good friend Brian Keating, who was a postdoc at Caltech, was visiting our group. Brian, who is white, pulled me aside and said, I know what's going on. I know why you're not coming to your office. I overheard a conversation with some other postdocs and they said that they want to punish you, close quote. So what did I do to them that would warrant punishment by shunning me? My friend volunteered the reason, You're quoting Brian again, they feel that they had to work so hard to get to the top and you got in easily through affirmative action, close quote. I must admit harboring, now you speaking, I must admit harboring both disdain for and envy of my postdoctoral colleagues. Most of them grew up with privilege that I did not have and a sense of entitlement that the enterprise of science belonged to people like them. I also presume that the relationship with physics was different from mine. So, Stefan, you just said, you know, you had a you know, middle class uh, background and you had a great education. So here you're really speaking to something along the lines of systemic racism, as it's called now. You know, it's just kind of mm -hmm. built into the system, even if maybe the individual people were not over, overtly racist. Um, you're hinting at something deeper here. Could just tell us a little bit what, what that's like experience that yeah um it's interesting because i sometimes feel and i've, I've definitely you know gone to some great lectures and um about about the notion of systemic racism but i think that you know when when a term is used so much and, and, and sometimes used in 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 certain contexts like you know by the media it loses its true meaning um and so, and I don't want to go and wait, um, use our time to go into, into like the definition of it. Um, I do think that, you know, there are lots of good um, material in terms of the scholarly understanding of, um, of, of systemic racism. Um, um, I think that, the, the, first of all, I think when I use the term privilege, right, I recognize my own privilege. I also recognize that the environment that I grew up in gave me certain advantages, um, which played out later on once I, you know, became a professor, for example, and I had the opportunity now to train other scientists. I had other ways of tra think, training them, um, other, other, other modalities, um, you know, that if, if you want to call it one style, you know, you know, the same way a musician will train younger musicians, you might have a different styles. And I think that came into play later on, that advantage and that privilege that I had. Um, so the privilege I think I'm referring to and why it's baked into the system may have something to do with, I think, the idea that we grow up, we, we, we grow up with certain images or presumptions about who does science, who is a good scientist. What do they sound like? What do they look like? You know, just cultural things. And I think that, um, you know, when we look at, I think some of my um, colleagues um, back then, um, postdoc colleagues, you know, I was just an alien. I, I mean, I had, to, <laughs> I had just moved from London. I was playing a lot of music back then. I had long dreadlocks, I, you know, and, 
And I, um, and I was working on weird things too. So I think like, you know, my characterization of what maybe a good physicist would look like to them was, and also it, it didn't fit in maybe with the culture, the culture of that place at that time. Um, and I think that the presumption was, well, because he looks and acts and talks and he, you know, he, he doesn't look like, he doesn't look and act and talk and quack like a duck, a duck meaning a good, maybe a good theoretical physicist. And also people that look like him who go through these types of, you know, come to places like where we are, usually they're probably not, and then this is the presumption, they're probably not, they probably didn't do the work. They probably got like, you know, a, um, you know, a, a hall pass maybe. Um, because again, there's a misunderstand of actually what affirmative action is and how it functions. Um, so I think that, I think that that was my reading as to why then, you know, they would really feel. So I'm, I think they generally felt like, man, we were slighted here. I mean, this, this guy just got, he doesn't really know his stuff. Um, what I think upset me, though, is they didn't give me the chance. Some of them didn't give me the chance. Now, the good thing, though, is that some did give me the chance, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, I ended up writing papers with some of them. Some, some of them are now my colleagues up till today. So, again, I think, you know, I wrote that part in the, in the book. I wrote about that to kind, of, um, to kind of set the stage because the rest of that chapter is to actually show that, you know, how did I respond to that? How did I deal with that? Did I just, you know, did I just, I don't know, what's the word, um, give in or just, you know, um, process the hurt and maybe the anger in a way that, that debilitated me even further? What did I do about that? And I think the rest of the book, I kind of, or the rest of that chapter, I kind of go into, into you know, how I was able to try to make that a productive situation. Yeah. Well, we're still dealing with race in America, as it's quite evident. And that is one of the possible side effects of affirmative action is, you know, white people thinking that black people are not qualified or whoever, Hispanic or Native American or whatnot, and they're only here because of this uh, affirmative action thing. It seemed clear enough to me. I know you pretty well. Stefan, I know your work. I've read your books. I, I went to that technical talk you gave at, at, at uh, Chapman that I, I didn't really understand, but you know, I was impressed. It's obvious you know your stuff. You know, you're not just bullshitting here and you know, you're a black guy, so you got in. No, it's obvious. So just giving somebody the chance, that, that's really all, all it, it takes, and, and it's good some people did. Now, let's address the outsider thing, right? It's right there in the title, mm -hmm. the subtitle of your book, An Outsider's Guide. I have to tell you, you know, I get lots of letters. I'm sure you get these as well uh, from true outsiders. Th these are people who have no training in <laughs> physics at all. They have a theory of everything. You know, Newton was wrong. Einstein was wrong. Feynman was wrong. And I've worked it all out. And I'll share the Nobel Prize with you if you help me with the math, right? <laughs> and uh, now those are outsiders. To them, you are an insider, <laughs> right? So when mm -hmm. you say you're an outsider on the inside, uh, what you're really talking about is sort of, a, I don't know, like a, a bell curve of, you know, where you're in the middle or you're kind of two standard deviations out in, in kind of creativity or braveness of putting forth new ideas. And you're like three or four standard deviations out maybe from the mainstream, but you're still in that box, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you are a trained physicist. You have degrees, postdocs, professorships. You're in the club. It's not like you're some outside outsider. Right. I 100% agree, and yeah, um, in line. And that was a hard thing to kind of like to to address in the book because you know, <clears throat> let's say that maybe there was some slick marketing scheme going on behind you know behind the scenes about you know somebody getting the book thinking, oh, all right, this you know this guy is one of us. Um, there, I mean, there's a part of me that like you know I have a soft spot, of course, for the outsider and any sort of outsider. But I, yeah, I do think that like, you know, where I was coming from with this is, you know, here's the best way I like to put it, because I'm, my best analogies always come back to music. Um, John Coltrane could play, you know, in jazz music, there's this thing about playing inside, meaning that you're playing the chord changes, you're playing within the structure, the harmonic structure of the music. And you know how to do that. That takes skill, technique, practice, um, and you know, a lot of musical education in terms of harmonic theory and yada, yada, right? So John Coltrane is an insider player. 
But he also, from time to time, will choose to play outside, meaning that, you know, Coltrane, and sometimes, again, I don't want to, you know, bastardize um, the, the term, but avant-garde or free jazz, you know, Train embraced that too. He embraced it. He embraced other players who were outside players. He embraced Pharaoh Sanders, right? Because he felt that they had something to, to, to contribute, to give to him, the person that had all this knowledge, right, about music. And I feel that there is a healthy balance um, of like, you know, when you um, attain a certain level of, um, of um, um, expertise, you know, uh, competence and all this stuff, like a good example was my, my first PhD advisor, who I always like to talk about. I usually talk about this guy every day. Is actually, I have a portrait of him uh, um, of, in my living room. Um, Leon Cooper, right, who won the Nobel Prize for superconductivity. And so he would always say, you know, not always, but he would oftentimes say to me and say to us, why do I want to talk to people that know exactly what I know? And of course, the statement is like, I know a lot, right? He wants to talk to people that could teach him something new. And I, of course, that's the way I would legitimate, oh, that's why you're talking to this, to this idiot, right? <laughs> so, when I was, so there's something, right, about a kind of a healthy open-mindedness, even when you're, when you're a master, when you've mastered something. And I, th I think that's part of embracing an outsiderness. So you're kind of, even if you're the, you're the most inside person, right? You're, you, you're the king. You're the emperor. Now you want to have no, no clothes on. <laughs> right. Yeah, I like that. Uh, but there's I a danger to it. But there's a danger to mm. it, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you might be spitballing creative new ideas, most of which are wrong. That's the danger, right? So you, you, you got to figure out how to sort them out. Well, one interesting thing that since I've written the book, my inbox has been gotten even more flooded <laughs> and I've gotten even more mail from, you know, from my outside crew. Mm, like what? Right? You mean people with alternative theories of physics? People with, you know, listen, I saw that you in, in your book, you talked about dark energy. Let me tell you what I have. I've been working on this for 15 years. Here's my, and they, you know, here's a PDF file of it. I would love to talk with you. You know, I'm available to talk to you finally. And think things like that. <laughs> here's my phone number. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. No, I've got, no, I've gotten phone number. I've gotten, you know, I said, listen, I can, one, you know, one, one guy uh, wrote me, said, listen, I live, you know, in Texas. I'm happy to drive up to Providence to meet you. Hmm. Wow. I said, okay, um, <laughs> let's, let me think about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, again, the problem is where, uh, what you mean by outsider, you mean outside, inside the box in the Coltrane kind of way. Uh, let me just tell you a story, uh, one of my favorite mm -hmm. Feynman, well, uh, Steve Gould stories that he told about Feynman. Uh, I've mentioned this I on the podcast. I love Feynman so, stories. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pardon, pardon for the repetition, but uh, Feynman saw that Gould was coming to Caltech to give a talk, and he called the office and said, you know, let's have lunch together. And of course, Gould is like, oh my God, lunch with the great Feynman. Yeah, sure. So Feynman proceeds at lunch to explain to him some ideas he has about evolutionary theory he's been thinking about. And, and according to Gould in one of his famous 300 essays he wrote for Natural History, and he says, well, basically he was describing sexual selection, which we've known about for 100 years, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, he, and he told Feynman, you know, this is an idea that you know, we've kind of had for a while. He goes, oh, well, I don't read anything because I want to come to it completely fresh, right? Just a totally new perspective on things. So sometimes that's good, but sometimes you're just repeating what's already been done, right? So there's the mm -hmm. rub, right? H how do you mm -hmm. know what's already been? You got to know something in your field, like what's already been done. Where, where are the frontiers? You have to know what the non-frontiers are to find the frontiers. Well said. I, I, I like that. That's, yeah, um, let me, yeah, let me riff on that a little bit. Um, that's correct. I think like um, knowing the rules so that you can properly know how to break them. Well, I don't know. I don't know if the notion of properly breaking rule, but you know, understand like you know. So, um, for years, I've been working on um, the cosmological constant problem, um, which is a very you know, in, you know, conceptually un insoluble and technically insoluble problem. But I had tried, you know, pretty much everything in a book and learned and, and read hundreds of papers including Steve Weinberg's over 100-page um, review of the cosmological constant, 
before I even started thinking about other ways around, I, I think it was very important for me to learn all the attempts by my colleagues like over the years as much as I could. So, I mean, one of the things I tell my students is like if we're um, attempting a new project, a new research project in some topic, I said, you must go and download every single, almost every single paper, all right, technical paper that's been written on that and understand all the attempts have been tried there. I mean, the idea that I'm going to just like that somehow on one, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, if you're like some super genius like Albert Einstein or Feynman, I guess you can pull that off, but I'm not that, right? I need to know what, what has been tried. I need to also, I call that working within the tradition, right? So I think that, you know, there are some standards here that we have to have, and there's a knowledge base that needs a, a toolkit. And one way I like to put this is the following. If I'm a painter, I have a canvas, I have a palette of colors, and I'm now going to paint something creative um, with, with, with these tools. Um, you know, I think like throwing, you know, the idea of, I'm, oh, you know what, I'm going to throw these colors away, right, the red, green, and blue, and I'm just going to take mud or whatever and paint with that, you know, and say, I'm, that's different than saying, for me, the, the notion of, my notion of outsider, right, from the inside is, I am not throwing away the colors. I'm keeping the colors. I'm just expanding my colors. I'm expanding my palette to include other tools, other, you know, other approaches, you know, other, you, you understand. So that's kind of what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm still painting within, you know, I'm still using red, green, and blue in the canvas. All right. I'm just, exp I'm trying to expand the toolkit um, and see if something works. Like, and, you know, 99% of the time it doesn't work actually. All right. But that's, that's, that's part of the game. It's a, it's a, it's a strategy. It's a strategy for research. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I loved your chapter on creativity. And I wonder, since, you know, Einstein played the violin and Feynman played the drums and you play the saxophone and, and so on, is, what's the link, do you think, between music and physics or maybe more broadly science and art or music or something like that and creativity? Yeah, I think the act of, um, for me, the act of, I think it's, it's twofold. I think anything that one engages in that's like, that is not saying you know, that you're a writer and you, you know, like for example, but like maybe you like to go and row a boat for like a few hours every day, every other day. I think getting away from the problem, getting away from the task at hand, there's something when you get away from it and how, whichever way you get away from it, be it blowing in a horn, be it going on long runs, going on a hike, flying a plane, I don't know, but getting away from it. Um, there's something where you, it, you, you can truly go offline, you know, and, and come back with a, with a new approach or maybe new insights that you can't will, right? You need to get out. So I think for me, music has functioned that way. Um, my readings of, of Einstein, it seems that it functions similarly for him there, going away and playing his violin or improvising on his piano. Um, and, um, but yeah, you know, I've definitely thought a lot about maybe also there's something cognitive that we yet don't understand um, about the engagement with music and doing things that are kind of like, you know, um, tasks that require that, that involve things like theoretical physics and mathematics. Um, the, the, it, 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 it feels like there's some, there's a way in which, and again, I don't, I don't know how it works and why it works, but I do know that when I, when I engage with my instrument and it doesn't even have to be going and playing gigs, just simply you know, picking up the horn and playing through some scales. And, um, there's something about that, that enables me to be a little bit better at, at, at my physics and the, my physics is theoretical is theorizing, you know? Yeah. 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 And calculating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, one thing I could say, one thing I could say, yeah, there's one thing I could say about that. Um, so I'm a very visual player. So as you know, I, you know, when I play my sax, I mean, there's a sense in which like, you know, you here's a, here's a scale, here's a major seventh, here's a dominant, da, 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 da. And there's a point in my playing though, where I really do try to l let go of that and visualize, you know, visualize what I'm playing. Um, and I think that 
the act of visualization and that task. Because a lot of my physics is also, you know, you're trying to always get a picture, you know, literally a mental picture of the problem that you're, you're, you're trying to attack. So I think that's one place in, I think in common that they have for me at least. Those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned the cosmological constant. Does that have to do with the accelerating expansion of the universe? And that's the mystery that hasn't been solved. Why is it accelerating? Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. Okay. And so the value, that, the, this constant, the value of it, its magnitude, how large it is, actually is in a one-to-one -one correspondence with how, how the rate at which the universe is accelerating. Hmm. You know, it, but in an explosion, isn't, doesn't the explosion accelerate at first before it decelerates? What if we're just in the early stages of the Big Bang explosion and it's still accelerating? I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, good, um, that's a good analogy. And in fact, that's the early acceleration. When, and so there was a stage in the early universe where, there, where that did happen. It's called cosmic inflation. Cosmic inflation is similar to what's going on today, except in cosmic inflation, that acceleration in the early universe after the bang um, was much, you know, that rate of acceleration was much higher, you know, um, you know trillions of times higher than what's observed today. So the, the mystery is that, at, you know, it accelerated and, and then slowed down, underwent like what appears to be constant, you know, vanishing acceleration, just constant velocity, and then accelerate again. And then mm. the weird thing is that it accelerates actually when we, when, you know, our form of matter comes on the scene, right? Because remember, in the early stage of the universe, it was so hot that matter couldn't co atoms couldn't form because it was so hot, right? They were buzzing around. And as it expanded and cooled, then there was a chance for atoms to form, right? For electrons to get trapped into the proton, right? And then after all that happened and stars and then, you know, planets and things came on the scene, the universe decided to accelerate again. And so there's this coincidence or this why now problem. Why is it doing it now? Interesting. And what are the leading explanations for that? Aliens. I'm just kidding. Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hey, just, it could be. Different. Maybe they've got some accelerating machine that's so powerful. <laughs> <laughs> well, my buddy, my buddy Jaron Lanier in the book, as you know, my buddy Jaron Lanier, we, had, yeah. we decided to have a spoof idea uh, about of that. Actually, the universe is accelerating because aliens are actually building um, virtual, um, very advanced virtual reality video games to their, you know, for, for their pleasure. Um, and... The, the way they do it is by actually um, using a, using this vacuum energy to this because it's a form of energy to power their their virtual reality video games. <laughs> you know, you have that se that section in your book, but I actually think you know if that was that's a, a, is, as good a thought experiment as any, like that we're living in a simulation and so on. But if yes. that were true, it seems like it, uh, we should be able to measure the energy being consumed to motor that kind of virtual reality. It would take a huge amount of energy, right? The computing power and so on that uh, th this is like the attempts to detect a Dyson sphere around a star. Uh, and, and that would be evidence of civilization instead of just looking for radio signals coming in. Uh, that would be something else or debris coming into our solar system like Avi Loeb is looking for. Your thought experiment would be if the aliens are like us, they're going to create a virtual reality and it's going to be so sophisticated, it's going to consume a lot of energy that we should be able to detect that. Am I saying that right? Yeah, and the detection of that is the, the measured amount of vacuum energy that we see, which is a cosmological constant. So the way, the, the, so the, the play on this is um, actually there are a few versions of what we call the cosmological constant problem. One problem, of course, why is it the value that it is? Okay. So the name of the game in physics, we like to measure quantities that are physical interests and that we think are fundamental. And this is Einstein's cosmological constant. It's saying something fundamental about our thing. And the reason why is because, so why is it the value that it is? And the reason why this is interesting is that particle physicists, um, and in fact, the language that Feynman helped create quantum field theory actually makes a prediction of this cosmological constant. And it turns out that the precision processes that we could compute and test in, in, in particle accelerators predict way too much vacuum energy. So 
the question is not that, that not that there um not only why is the vacuum energy or the cosmological constant they're synonymous with each other um the value that it is is that you know why is what's happening to all of the vacuum energy that should be around and so our game was to say oh it's being used that's the power supply for the video games of the advanced alien civilization so it was a thought experiment but a part of that um, of that of that chapter, for example, and that ex thing is to show that um, you know the whole point of thought experiments in terms of developing um, strong theory is that sometimes you have to you have to imagine the most absurd thing and then kind of work your way back and you know and you know and be your own your own best skeptic actually you know so the I, the part of that was just, just to show that really good theorizing. Is not only about trying to always trying to um, deny what's you know deny things to prove your idea wrong. It's you come up with an idea and then you figure out you have to be its own worst nightmare. Your job is to kill it. Your job is to figure out ways to kill your own theory. So right. So in fact, you, we have to be our own best skeptic. <laughs> yeah, I always show that hard. video clip of uh, Feynman lecturing at Cornell in 1964, and he has that mm. great line about it doesn't matter what your name is, how beautiful your guess is, and, and so on and so on. Mm. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. Well, <laughs> yeah. So is this your answer to the Fermi paradox? Where is everybody? Namely that if we're not special, we're in the middle of the bell curve of evolved civilizations. There should be plenty ahead of us. And if they were, they should have been here by now. They haven't been. So where is everybody? Your answer is they're home of doing virtual reality. <laughs> well, yeah, they're home. And that's a good point because the, you know one answer, as you know, to the firm power is that we're not interested in them. Well, then the question is why are we not interested in them? And then, like you know, of course, um, you know, some of us, some people who um, have a lot of faith in humanity, of course, will say because we're idiots and <laughs> because human beings we're just the worst creatures out there. And, you know, and there, there's no way anybody would want to pay attention to us who's so advanced. That's no, no, that's a reason that, that is an answer to the Fermi paradox that I actually like. Um, uh, so my version is a is a is a, um, a more inclusive, you know, version, uh, you know, so it's a, a version that says, isn't that we're not interested? It's just they're so they're, they're so busy having so much fun playing their VR video games. It's so advanced. If you think our games are cool. If you think if you think our Hollywood and movies are cool, they're having such a great time using this vacuum energy. Yeah, and of course, a, a it's lot a of Disneyland people, out there for them. It, yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, it could be more interesting than physically exploring the cosmos. Although, you know, who knows? Seems like it would be super interesting. But you know, it could be just our species likes to leave home and go and explore things. So we think, well, that's what everybody else would do where are they why aren't they here exploring well maybe they just don't do that they have a different motive uh something like that it's so hard to think of what aliens might be like since we have an n of one <laughs> at least right. ourselves uh unless you count other species okay a couple other questions what you talk a lot about fields in your book what is a field ah great 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 um so um there are so um there are two types of fields I think is important to distinguish. One is a classical field, and the other is a quantum field. So a classical field is the perfect, great example of that is a magnet. I mean, if I take two magnets, put them to, not close to each other, but they don't, have, they don't even have to touch, right? They can exert a force on each other without ever touching each other. So there's some action at a distance happening, and it really, there's a, there's a material, it's called a magnetic field, it's invisible, but it does exist because it has energy and it could exert a force. So a field is some kind of extended entity, material, let's say a fluid-like material, if you want to give it some kind of characteristic, that has extent, right? It's extended. It's not just localized like a particle. It has extent, and it can warp and bend, and the, and the, the action of its warping and bending could actually carry energy and exert forces on on objects like so if anything would charge or mass you know the the field associated with massive objects is the gravitational field that's a weird field because that field itself is space-time itself as Albert Einstein taught us and space-time can bend because the field of space-time can bend and that's where we get gravitational forces from 
we are moving along the contours of a warp space space um, that is created by the sun bending the gravitational field and the earth is just moving along the contours and we call that a gravitational force. No, Einstein said it's really just the gravitational field, which is space itself that is warped and it's invisible. So those are classical fields and we're very familiar with it. Our, a lot of our modern technology is about the manipulation of electromagnetic fields. Um, you know, um, so we understand that quantum fields are when we think about fields that are actually intrinsically quantum mechanical. And so that, I'm actually teaching our graduate level, I teach our graduate level year-long sequence at Brown um, on quantum field theory, so I should know something about it. But it's, it's a, you know, it's a two-year sequence, um, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's very heavy stuff. But in essence, one way to think about what a quantum field is, and, um, you know, my friend Sean Carroll has a nice podcast, um, not pod, but a discussion on, on videos on, online where he does a really good job. But let me see if I can do some justice there. So let's take our magnetic field, all right? And let's imagine that this magnetic field is now a quantum magnetic field. Actually, that's a bad example. Let me, let me, let me. there are certain fields, and you can use a picture now of a magnetic field, but there are certain fields where the, what makes it quantum? What makes it quantum is that a field, a field can vibrate, right? You can imagine a field actually undergoing some oscillatory undulation. And it turns out that by, if these, these vibrations in a quantum field could actually be quantized, meaning that they can carry, right? There's, they, they, they have discrete vibrations. So they can, their vibrational pattern is like a musical note, right? Like I have a C to a D, it's discrete, right? So the vibrational pattern of a field can vibrate in a discrete way. And it turns out that those discrete vibrations, right, is responsible for the field to create a particle. So the field concept is the mother, it's sort of like, it, um, it's the overarching concept in, in, in physics. So from fields, you get both waves and particles. So you probably learned that in quantum mechanics, you have wave-particle duality. So the field now explains what that duality really is. The field itself can undergo wave-like vibrations. Those wave-like vibrations can be quantized. And when, when they're quantized, those fields um, would actually generate a particle from the void, from the vacuum. All right? And so different vibrational patterns of a field can create many particles. And then these particles depend on the field configuration can, and the field interactions can now collide and, and you know, annihilate or get created or do interesting things. And that's exactly that picture uh, was developed by Richard Feynman and um, his colleagues. Um, and Feynman came up with a diagrammatic way of representing that, that, that idea of field vibrations, fields moving in and colliding, and they're called Feynman diagrams. Yes. Well, the next time you're in town, remind me, and I'll take you to see Feynman's van with the Feynman diagrams oh. on it. There's a, there's oh, a long please, story. I love that. There's a long story about it. It's, it's uh, safely stored in a, a storage unit now, but yeah, it's, it's great. So there's a video of Feynman at the Esalon Institute in Big Sur where he's you know talking about science and spirituality, or whatever, too much of New Agers. But he's explaining why, I think if I recall, like, for example, why doesn't the chair leg fall through the floor since atoms are mostly empty space? And he said, because they're jiggling. He used the word jiggling. I think what he meant is what you just said, right? The feet, it's fields. Mm -hmm. That's right. It is actually the field picture. It, right. is, a, it is a mother language of, um, of physics. Like mm -hmm. um, everything basically now, even so all the forces at some level, at a fundamental level, we will, you know, we um, is a field. That's a unifying idea. That's the unifying mm, principle. Yeah. So, and if I followed you correctly, then there there were no particles, and then there were particles that came out of the field. So, would it be correct. would it be correct to say something came from nothing, but it's not nothing because there's a field. That's correct. That's correct. I would say that um, these fields are all around. They were not materialized, meaning that the field could exist, but the, what what we call the vacuum or nothing, meaning no particles. But then, you know, the field could actually 
generate those particles due to due to field interactions. So you can have fields, but then these fields can interact with each other, right? And um, the nature of these interactions um, can generate, of course, the particles, which are the field vibrations. Well, here's my point. So there's, there is this idea that there was nothing in the early universe yeah, in, the, in its right, past, yeah. yeah. Well, this is where I'm going with this. You know, theists always say, well, you can't get something from nothing. Well, apparently you can if what you just said is correct. But I guess it depends on what you mean by nothing. That's right. So then what, you know, so then, you know, that's right. So nothing meaning that, you know, you'd get no part, you know, if I, I can now define the notion maybe of empty space with no particle, right? We can run the clock back and model a universe and, and have a, some description mathematically of that. We could talk about that. Um, but the minute you sort of turn on quantum mechanics, <laughs> Right, then it's really an operational question. You know, because what Feynman and his colleagues taught us is that that question, it, it's nothing in, in dependent on what, Not, nothing dependent on, for example, at what re resolution, temporal resolution scale you are asking that question, you are asking about what's around. What Feynman would say is that if I, if I, if I can blink my eyes, you know, one billionth of a second, I'll actually, I, 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 you know, I'll actually see things coming in and out of existence, right? But if I, if I have a very show, slow um, shutter camera, right, then it'll appear that there's nothing there. Right. So, yeah, so you, you make a statement in your book about, like, the early universe. Even if you, well, let me see if I get this straight. Even if you took all the stuff out of the universe, there's no physical stuff at all, there would still be the field. So when people like you or Stephen Hawking famously said something like, you know, quantum foam fluctuation out of which the universe arose, what does that mean, quantum foam fluctuation? It's one of these fields, right? Is that what you're, is, yeah. is that what that it's means? Right, right. That's right. It's these fields that's, it's these fields um, seen through a given representation of the field. So, um, you know, there are different ways of, of describing the field. So, for example, I could, I can, I can, the fields are there, and then I can say, well, if I choose to look at the field through the lens of vibrations, right, I'll see this foam, foamy business. But, right, if I look at the field um, where those are not good observables, for lack of a better word, I may not, you know, I, I'll probably miss those. I mean, but Stephen is absolutely correct in what he, what he said, of course. Um, but I suppose the theist would then say, well, where did the field come from? Who made that? Is that even the right question? Maybe it's just, was all, there's always fields. And our universe is just a manifestation of one of these fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this goes back to, um, is the field description and the end story, the end game? Um, so right now, what we, what we do have in terms of the physics we know that we've experimentally tested at the Large Hadron Collider, is that it seems that everything, everything are these fields. But then there's this idea of the unified field theory, the idea that maybe there's some overarching structure that's beyond fields, okay, um, where fields come from. And, you know, so some people are saying, well, actually, it's strings, like string theory, and that, you know, the fields emerge from these strings. And, in fact, that's, a, that's one of the things that actually string theory um, so, um, you know, does... Um, predict actually you you know the if i can start with with strings and when i quantize these strings it generates the different vibrational patterns of the strings give me the different fields actually um that we appear that appear to be different from each other but from the perspective of string theory it's just a string that's um that's generating um this spectrum of fields um there are some other answers that say maybe it's a matrix right um that basically it's really, you know, you, you have to give up the very, the very structure of space-time that we've been talking about that contain fields. You have to give that up. And then, you know, space and time actually become this very weird, bizarre situation that it's hard to even speak about with words. Um, at least I can't do it, right? So there's words like non-commutative geometry or that maybe the universe is digitized in some ways. It's... Um, the idea of how do you interpret, right, these, these equations, 
is always gonna, you know going to be an issue. But I, I I do believe fundamentally that um, that there is something beyond in terms of um, these fields because. The name of the game in, in physics research, at least, it's like we, we have the theory, but when we, what we do now is look at where the theory fails, where it fails experimentally, and or like maybe there's some experimental, uh, you know, some, uh, some anomaly in the experiments that the theory itself cannot explain or fails at explaining, or even some issues with the theory, certain divergences, certain instabilities in the theory. And the idea is that, you know, it's our job to in trying to fix those problems, right? It could lead us to the correct, the, 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 a, a clearer. It's it's we're really searching for clarity at the end of the day. So we're not just trying to get lost in the mathematics, right? We're using the math as a tool to give us conceptual clarity about the physics. But there is math that we have to to to, to deal with, and we talk to mathematicians, and we talk to the experimentalists. But we it's because we're searching for that clarity. Mm. Just as a just as a technical note, you know the the metaphor of the planet going around the sun not by gravity but because the sun distorts it like a a big lead ball on a rubber sheet and the marble goes around it not because it's being tugged toward the the big the big uh, lead ball but because it's falling around that warped thing. Okay, mm. how does that explain? You know, my pin just falls. Oops, sorry. <laughs> you know, the pin just falls straight down. Well, that's gravity. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like that metaphor. It's bending around the weight of what? I mean, it's just falling on my desk. Good, good. So the uh, yeah. So that's good. So um, the 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 form of the gravitational field, meaning its shape, its contours, um, will change. You know, as I go from uh, from different when I go from say very close to the Earth. So once I'm in, once I've so there's a notion of um, of um, in the gravitational when I took a, a two bot gravitational bodies, right, where the warping of space time really has to do with also the state of motion. It's not just only a function of like, you know, so gravity, is, you know, is a dynamical field, right? So the warping is not something that's just fixed in time, but it also depends on the velocity. So if 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 the two planets, if the one planet is moving fast enough, right, it experiences a warping of space that's or, or geodesic, okay, that is circular or elliptical. However, if it doesn't have a fast enough velocity or it's at rest, um, the the nature of the gravitational field will be to pull it in. So the, 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 it can be shown that they're both mathematically consistent with Einstein's field equations, meaning the equations that determine these field lines, okay, or this warping of the space time. It's a great, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, good. Now, you mentioned the limitations of words. You know, at some point we just end up, we're using words. What do they mean? Do you think there's just some limit, epistemological limitations to our cognition? We just don't have the, the words or the mathematics to get at some further question down the line before the Big Bang or whatever. Where'd the field come from? Well, it came from this. And at some point we just hit a wall and we, we can't talk anymore. Or there's no more math to do. And maybe the aliens, maybe the aliens have brains ten times the size of ours, because their females have much larger pelvises, so they can have huge mm -hmm. headed babies mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. can figure it out because they have, you know, bigger brain. I don't know. What do you think about mm -hmm. that? Yeah, yeah, I, I go back and forth with with actually that thought, um, because you know the kind of things I work on definitely is mind bending, for lack of a better word, um, and so there are times when I'm just like, okay, I'm getting a headache here. There's no way that, you know, and then there are times where like, where, uh, I mean, and connected to that is thoughts where I'm, I'm like, okay, you know, there, there are times where I'm like, I wish I was as smart as Ed Wynn, for example, because if I was as smart as Ed Wynn, I'll be able to really see, I'll be able to solve this problem. And then I would have the thought, but imagine that there's a being that's a million times smarter than Ed Wynn, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> right. Um, so the question now is, is there are there things that even that mind or that brain cannot conceive of that has to do with our reality? That's a question that I've, I've definitely asked. And so I come. To, I, so there's a thought experiment that I've had, which is exactly what you said there, which is. Could it just be that 
by definition, there's just some things, definitely the human mind could just never know because of the hardware, right? Okay, so there's definitely that. I've definitely had that thought and I still lean on that. I, I still believe that more than this other thought. The other thought is, yeah, but it's, it's nuts that if you look at, for example, our perceptual apparatus, right? Seeing whatever, the, the different ways we, we perceive the reality that we're in. That we have that mathematics is this one counterexample. Like it's like through mathematics, for example, and now computation, we can know things that we were not designed to know, right? <laughs> it seems, it seems that like that we, our perceptions, we can come to know these things, right? And, you know, as you know, Einstein had like this interesting quote, which he said, like, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible at, at, at all, meaning that there's some things that could be comprehended because in his mind, I guess, it's just like that, that, that ability to comprehend, he found it to be incomprehensible. Trying to understand that is incomprehensible. Um, but, you know, which is this paradox, which is it appears that every time I think that we're not going to be able to understand something, somebody understands it. <laughs> and, and I'm talking about in physics, right? Right, right. Yeah. Although you could apply it to larger questions like why, why should you trust science? Why use science? Or what's, how do you know rationality is the rational thing to do? You know, you just turn it on itself. And, you know, maybe that's just one thought too many. Just, just stop asking questions. It's how the hardware runs. You know, we make logical deductions. And, yeah. and it doesn't get it any further to ask, again, why is it that way? That's just the way. It's like, it'd be like asking, why does my calculator, you know, multiply the way it does? That's what it's designed to do. That's what the hardware does, right? And so, you know, maybe asking those kind of questions, it just, you just it hit a wall there. And we can't go any further. You know, like, Absolutely. like Max Tegmark's, you know, the, the universe is mathematical. I don't even know what that means. I, I mean, I've asked people. Explain it to me. I'm not sure I really intuitively get it, um, but maybe that's pushing up against that wall. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, you know, I'm sympathetic to that idea, but it's um, I don't. Um, I, I, let's say I, I have a hard enough time with my own problems. <laughs> um, but I, I, one interesting <laughs> thing about that, you know, is that that's funny. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, one interesting thing about uh, what you just said there, and and your question actually. Um, it's related to something else that, had that, that, you know, it's a quote from Abdus Salam, you know, the Nobel Prize winner, the Pakistani Nobel Prize winner. He won the Nobel Prize for um, electroweak um, co-discovering with, along with Steven Weinberg and Shelley Glashow, um, the electroweak unification, the quantum field theory that unifies the electromagnetic and the weak interactions. And in his Nobel spe speech, pri Nobel Prize speech, he said, Scientific inquiry is a common heritage of humanity. So in other words, his observation, and he's somebody that actually was very studied the history of science a lot, he even wrote a book on it, is that actually no matter where you go on the globe and you look back at history, and this idea that somehow scientific and this type of, this way of thinking, mathematics and science, is only something that, you know, that, that happens with Europeans, it's happened all over the world. I mean, the Rin papyrus is this old papyrus from Egypt. They don't have, I don't know, definitely over a thousand years before, before Greece came on the scene, you know, Pythagoras and, you know, Plato and others. And you will find mathematical equations. There. It's something that humans do. If you leave us alone, no matter what culture we find ourselves in, we might apply to different things, you know, um, you know, not, um, you know, not enough weaves in complicated ways, right? I mean, but that mathematical um, ability and that type, that type of thing, amongst other types of things in thinking, including music, musical thought, right, um, is there, right? So I find I, I, that's just sort of like a corollary of what you just said there, which is that we let the hardware run. Like, we're going to do this. We're going to be thinking. We're going to be doing math and trying to un use that as a lens. It seems to be a, a sixth sense that that human culture has developed, right? And we could learn it, we can teach it to each other, we could pass it on, just like we pass on language. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, we, Steve Pinker uh, toyed with that idea in our issue on, are we living in a post-truth world? His answer is, well, um, 
No, because it, it, that statement alone would have to be defended. And the moment you open your mouth, you've refuted yourself because you have to give arguments for why you think we're living in a post-truth world, right? <laughs> so Yeah, he's, and, a, he's a clever guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed he, he is. You know, yeah. I, I got a, a great Steve Pinker story. Um, oh, yeah. So one time, um, so I'm, you know, I'm friendly with, um, I'm friends with, and I was friends with his, his um, with Rebecca Goldstein. And so Steve and Rebecca back, you know, a number of years ago, I invited them and some colleagues over my place. This is when I was at Dartmouth for dinner. So I was in my kitchen making Trinidadian curry chicken. And I was with this big knife chopping the chicken. And Steve was in, in the kitchen and, you know, he, we were both drink. he was drinking a glass of wine. We're talking. And then, um, and I knew that he wrote this book, you know, I forget what book, but he said, but he made a, there was, he started a big argument, a big debate in the music cognition community, because he made a statement that music is evolutionary cheesecake, meaning that, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing mm -hmm. deep yeah. about it. It's nothing cognitive. And then people like Danny Levithan, you know, people, it was a fun thing to debate in that, yeah. in that community. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. here I am thinking that I was going to write this book and I was scared to tell Stephen <laughs> about that I was going to write an entire book about why jazz music is like physics, right? <laughs> so anyway, so, you know, we're, he, we're in the kitchen and I have this big knife, I'm chopping the chicken. And um, he goes, so what do you, what do you think? Um, Rebecca tells me, right, you're thinking of writing a book. And I was like, yeah, I'm writing this book about, um, and I know that, you know, you said this thing about music, but I'm writing this book about jazz music and physics. And he goes, oh, that's a great idea. You know, you should call that book The Jazz of Physics. <laughs> there you go. So he gave me my book title. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's really funny. That's a good story. Well, thank yeah. you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will pass that along to him. He'll be out here mm -hmm. uh, next month uh, for nice. some conference. We're going to go for a bike ride. Anyway, yeah. Thomas said hi. <laughs> I will indeed. Okay, a couple other things. So uh, on the Nick Bostrom, it's more than 50% probability we're living in a, uh, a simulation now. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, oh, I mean, <laughs> there's a part of me that's like, it's hard to be, I mean, right? Um, you know, when I look at, when, if, when I study sort of like the laws of physics and I study the Big Bang, then I look at the struct, the fact that we have this, a brain that is very, a very, very advanced form of circuitry. Um, it's interesting to entertain whether that actually, I mean, in a sense, like, you know, here's one way in which I think he's right. Um, the mathematical equations that we have, right? I mean, the, the various solutions are like, you know, running a code. It's like running a simulation, like different, you know, I, so I give you this matrix equations and stuff, and I, I turn the knobs this way, I manipulate the, the equations, of mental, and it presents basically different outcomes of a program. In a lot of ways, if you think about these equations that govern our physical law as some very complicated um, algorithm and program, the solutions generate actually simulations in a, a lot of ways. That's how we get to make predictions of our theory, right? We predicted the Higgs particle, right? We had a set of, um, you know, a set of equations, quantum mechanical equations, um, and we knew that the principles of, of quantum field theory, we, one of the sacred ones was something called unitarity, the conservation of probability, and that the theory would fail if, un unless you had something that looks like a Higgs, a Higgs field, and this was used, right? This was used in the theory to fix that, to, to keep that principle of the master code. And then that thing was, that was developed in the 60s, that idea. And then there was a prediction that this should be a particle called a Higgs particle, which should have these properties, you know, um, and should interact in these ways, and it should give mass to particles in this particular way. And all those properties were found, right, uh, by the Large Hadron Collider. So it's like, it's like a code. So in that sense, but the question is, of course, but it's like, what is a substrate? And, you know, obviously, you, you run into all these now issues of like, okay, who, you know, not who, but... Anyway, I'll, I'll leave that up for the philosophers to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're really touching on um, a kind of a philosophy of science problem. That is, to, to what extent does a theory need to be tested, or at least in principle, be falsifiable, right? So mm -hmm. had the Higgs not been found, would that have falsified it, or, or just left it hanging there until we can do more research? Oh, that's a good thing. Um, I think in the case of the Higgs, if the Higgs wasn't found... Um, 
it would have made my job and the job of a lot of field theorists and particle physicists really interesting and uh, very difficult because then we would have had to go, it's like, wait a minute, there's a baby in bathwater here. Like the principles underlying our standard model is highly, it's highly constraining, right? Uh, the predictions had so far made, you know, 12, 13 decimal points in accuracy between what's observed and what's predicted. And then are you telling me that now using the same machine, same principles, same equations, I don't find this thing. Then it would mean that basically in the regime that, that the theory is, we thought the theory was going to be operating, the theory is falsified in that regime, but it is, but it is, um, it is operational and correct in another regime, similar to how Newton's laws break down when I actually start asking about cause and effect. Albert Einstein showed that the theory had an internal inconsistency. It had a spooky action in the distance. And in trying to fix that, he came up with, with, um, with general relativity. So, but he was, he, it's very important that general relativity in the right regime, in the right approximation, gave me back everything we knew about Newton, because that's how we can fly satellites out there, right? Mm-hmm. And right, so, <laughs> so Einstein becomes world famous after Eddington tested his theory that's with right. the eclipse Absolutely. experiment, although that's a pretty interesting story because there were two um, teams, and one, you know, so Newton had made certain predictions about the bending of light, and Einstein made predictions that were more extreme. And the one team found one closer to Einstein, and the other team, which was partially clouded out, and the data was kind of fuzzy, it looked like it might be closer to Newton, but in any case, uh, Eddington pushed the, the other team closer to Einstein, and it was uh, later co corrobor corroborated. Uh, and so we know Einstein was right about that, and that's what put him on the map. Now, can a theory be accepted without a mechanism? Uh, let me just give you an example, like the theory of evolution and natural selection. You know, Darwin had no mechanism. He didn't know about DNA or anything like that, and he had some funky theories about you know, gamules blending, and he didn't know. No one knew. Right. And it wasn't until 53 with Crick and Watson decoding DNA. OK, that's how it happens. Now we have a mechanism or Alfred Wegener saying, look, it looks like continents drift around the globe. But, you know, a lot of the pushback was, yeah, well, that's just patternicity. <laughs> they didn't use that word. But, you know, you just think the, 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 the continents look like they fit together. That's just accident. Because what could possibly push continents around the globe? They're too heavy until they got plate tectonics in the 1950s. Oh, okay, there's these giant cells and it's a liquid core and it's pushing them and all that stuff. You know, so to, to what extent can some theories of in physics be just accepted because they're mathematically beautiful or they, they fall, they, they pass tests experimentally, even if you don't know what's behind it, like Newton famously, well, what is gravity? Well, I, I feign no hypotheses, right? I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. This is what it does, and I can predict that, and that's all we need to know. Yeah, yeah. I think we're entering into that sort of like um, Alice in Wonderland type of place in modern physics where we would like to tell a story and, um, and, and grasp with some, you know, some, some picture or mechanism or physics, right? Um, or in, or relate, it, relate it to things that we can, by analogy, we can imagine, we can see and imagine. But yeah, I think that like, you know, there are already things in say quantum field theory or in general relativity that just simply is, um, you know, a set of mathematical relations, <laughs> you know? Um, so, but I, I, let me push this a little bit further. Um, it could be that one of the things we'll learn about physics is that there, there are certain mathematically, mathematically consistent Here's one example. Um, for quantum, quantum mechanics works. One of the reasons why it works is that it, right, it, it uses a gadget, a mathematical gadget called a complex number. Right? So if I say, hey, you know, I, um, you know, I square, if I take minus one and I multiply with minus one, I get one. Right? If I take minus one and I multiply with one, I get Minus one, if I, you know, we get that. That's all intuitive, right? You know, if I add a positive number to a negative number, right? Right, they cancel out. Minus one plus, you know, whatever. 
but then the imaginary numbers is like already some a place where um it's hard to imagine so i you know i square a number right and i get a negative number you know i square when i say this, i square the same number i take a number right and i i multiply it by itself and i get a negative number every time you try to do that with a number that you know it's impossible to do that if i take minus one and i multiply it with how do i get minus one from that well i have to multiply with plus one if i multiply with the same number i, I get plus one right so so we we create a number called i we just we just you know call it the letter i and we say i square is equal to minus one that's how we define it but quantum mechanics rely on that number it uses it's at the heart of quantum mechanics so already this quantum physics that we know and love right? These qubits that we're trying to manipulate with quantum computers, right? That's how, it, 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 that, that, that's how it's animated in the real world. It uses actually this imaginary number. And for that, there's really no conceptual way to understand that, really. Well, you quote Feynman saying no one really understands quantum physics. Well, if he doesn't understand it, you know, what hope does anybody else have? But this is what you mean, right? It does, maybe like when Newton says, "I don't know what gravity is." It just it makes it allows us to make predictions that come true. Is that what you mean with quantum physics? I mean, there's something at its foundation that's just not comprehensible by the human mind, just because it's so weird. But it does things that we can predict. We can build stuff and and make run experiments, and they come true, and that's how we know it's real. Hundred percent agree with that statement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, Stefan, let's uh, get to it toward the end of your book and the big question of consciousness. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yeah, you get pretty speculative there, but I like that. You know, Deepak Chopra and I have go way back and, and I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love that story of your encounter with him. And, you know, he's interesting. He, he thinks that, uh, I mean, I, I always call him a dualist. He goes, no, no, I'm not a dualist. I'm a monist, a mind monist. That mm -hmm. is, there's just one substance or one thing, and it's it's consciousness or mind, and physical stuff is you know the the derivative of mind, right? So monist, not dualist, and uh, and so this gets us to these fields, <laughs> back to the fields, you know, maybe, and I forget who you quoted, because uh, I, I, I I know this guy, but I forget his name now, whose whose theory of consciousness is that it's fields that you can measure with EEGs and so on, like like that. Uh, so, Ch um, David Chalmers but, definitely is one of the people that. Proponent, yeah, David it, Chalmers yeah? is okay. one, right? Right, there was, but there was somebody else as well. In any case, you know, if you look in Wikipedia under you know the hard problem of consciousness, there's like two dozen theories. So, th to me, it seems like there's something wrong here. Maybe it's concept we're conceptualizing it incorrectly or we're using the wrong words. It's such a weird thing, you know, what is consciousness? What it's like to be something? What does that mean? You know, I know what I mm -hmm. it's like to be me, but I don't know what it's like to be you. And I, you know, the little homunculus in my head can't tiptoe over into your head and go, oh, that's what it's like to be Stefan Alexander. I see that mm -hmm. we can't do that. So, you know, so maybe the hard problem is just it's hard because we're, we're not conceptualizing it. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm, um, I'm in alignment with that. I think one, um, one, my, my one way into this was to, and, but I, it's not, it wasn't, it's not my idea, but I, I would like to think that I reason my way to the, that conclusion, but, uh, and maybe it's Chalmers, but I think that I kind of ex expanded the idea into the, into the picture of fields. So let me just say it this way. So, um, so we can ask the same question when we say, what is an electron, right? What is an electron? So we say, well, we're going to do, we do some experiment. J.J. Thompson discovered the electron, looking at probing all these properties. And then Stern and Gerlach and others discovered that the electrons have a quantum spin. So there are these irreducible properties that the electron does have, right? That cannot, that doesn't seem to be reducible. It just is. So for example, it has a quantum spin that, that just it that, that can be reduced to something more basic than a spin that it doesn't emerge from it just has a spin and that is just a fundamental intrinsic property of what it is what what the elect, what defines and what electron is it has mass it has ch electric charge it has something called lepton number we uh, so all the experiment we've done to probe we can those are the things that come together to say that this is an electron 
and it is not a, you know, a positron. This is the electron. And the idea of um, the panpsychism pan idea is to say, well, maybe the same way the electron has energy, right? Maybe there's this thing, um, uh, uh, some subunit of consciousness, like, a, like, like the electric charge. It just, it's a fundamental property of the existence of the electron. And that property, it's the same way spin can generate a magnetic field, or it can interact um, with other electrons by the spin orientation, right? It allows the electron to interact or come together to make more um, aggregate things. Well, maybe this unit, this unit of proto-consciousness can come together to actually create even more and more complex internal experiences. And so that seems to be consistent with our, you know, that, it, that, that you know, the way our brains are wired up um, does give the epi epiphenomenon of, of our form, our states of consciousness, because, you know, all the subunits actually have their own, uh, you know, fundamental units of consciousness. But when they come together, you get this, this kind of epiphenomenon. And that's why a fly's consciousness Right, and the way it's patterned is different than a, a squirrel's consciousness than it is ours. So it doesn't take away from the idea that the that the neurons in our brain does play a role in our consciousness, but it also kind of gets gets around the, this question about for me about um, that you know what is consciousness? Well, if I just posit as an as an axiom that is the same at the same level. Um, the electric charge and lepton number and all these things are fundamental properties of matter. Well, this seems to be a fundamental, could be a fundamental property, but it can have an, a vast array of complexity in, in its, its quality of, its, of, of, of the existence of the object, which is that there's a notion of an outside and an inside, and that object can, um, can, can distinguish that inside and outside experience. Hmm. So maybe in a way, this is one of these one thought, two many. And I call that, that's what I call locality, right? That's locality. locality. Yeah, you, cannot, okay. you cannot be localized if, unless you have an external, mm. um, you know, uh, reference to. Um, so, for example, the entire universe is just a non-local phenomenon. There's nothing outside of it, right? Right. Well, so if I'm following you, it's just part of the, it's just the way it's, I'm sorry, it's built into nature. It's who, it's like, like why is there gravity? Well, there just is. That's just the way it is. It's That's just part of the, the way it is. Things will never be the same. <laughs> but that song. <laughs> yeah. Very good. That's yeah. really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then we get down to, you know, does the universe, did the universe need consciousness to come into existence like your uh -huh. two slit experiment? How does the electron know to go through the left slit or the right slit? Well, it, it, when it's observed, then it knows, well, what does that even mean? I mean, you could have a camera as the observer. It doesn't have to be conscious, right? So, um, so does the universe need something like consciousness or mind to come into existence? No, this is, um, okay, when I, when I was writing the book, I got very excited. And I was like, oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> but now I'm like, wait a minute. What if there's something beyond consciousness, right? <laughs> what about that? Okay, so what if consciousness also is something that is secondary to something beyond it? And that's maybe that's what the universe that, that that's you know um, another way I was like also thinking about it is that um, in like a grand in a unified theory like for the standard model for example there's an idea in which like you know um, the coexistence right when the forces are unified they are all coexisting at the same time and there's nothing within in, in at that level of you know, of um, the forces being unified that can distinguish um, one force from the other. And what happens is that a symmetry is broken, right? That symmetry is a thing, that break, broken symmetry distinguishes, you know, what's now the electromagnetic force, what's now the weak force, right? And so the idea of breaking a symmetry, a pencil falling to the ground, right? I've broken the rotational symmetry, meaning that the pencil could have gone in any direction, right? Um, so there's an ambiguity now. The pencil, it's a confused pencil. It doesn't know what direction to fall in. They're all nice. Right, um, it's like the mule that refuses to eat the meal, whatever. If you're given, <laughs> okay, and will starve to death. Um, so, so yeah, the idea now of unification in that sense is that there's an ambiguity, or like you cannot distinguish these forces from each other. 
Um, so one idea is that imagine you have the world of, you know, you have the, the notion of, you have consciousness, you have the realm of consciousness, you have the realm of, of um, matter and matter and fields and forces, things like that. Maybe at some unified level, none of those concepts, right? They're all, because there's a symmetry between them, they're all, it means that they're, neither of them are, are, are good descriptions of actually the, of the universe. But basically, there was some symmetry breaking, and the, uh, this, this consciousness, this, you know, the, the, the distinguish between matter and consciousness, all these things, space and time, right, is some kind of symmetry breaking that now where these things appear to be different phenomena of something that's, that, 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 um, that supersedes them, that, but those things are not, they, it, it, they don't exist at that level. But I don't, that's just, I'm just carrying, you know, I'm just doing that inference, that kind of, the same type of inference we do, right, when I'm, by analogy with what we've learned so far in the unification process in physics, which is the symmetry break-in, this is notion that things cannot be distinguished at that level, and those descriptions um, are not useful descriptions um, for, for that, you know, unified description. Do you think mind or consciousness needs some kind of substrate to run on? Based on the, what we've learned from Albert Einstein, which is the idea that um, you see gravity, the gravitational force, rests on a principle called background independence, that you have to give up actually the very notion of a background space-time, all right? Because any background is as good as any other background, so therefore, if, any, if they're all equivalent, you have to give it up. So this idea of background independence. So if you take this background independence principle to the furthest extent, when we believe it actually is fundamental, <clears throat> um, then I would say that it would not require a substrate to run on. Hmm. Interesting. I think that's what Deepak uh, thinks. I think he would agree with that. Um, that it it is its own thing that doesn't need a material machine to run on. Right. Mm -hmm. But then that takes it into a different realm. Do you ever wish you could come back like 500 years from now and find out what they discovered? Like, oh, dark energy. We figured that out 200 years ago. <laughs> Here it is. Yeah, oh, I would. All right. <laughs> I would. I would. And, you know, I, you know, one of my guesses is that I think there was a Feynman quote, which is like, you, you'll come back and realize that how stupid we were. And it was like something really simple, <laughs> right. you know? <laughs> right. Right. Why didn't I think of that? Right. right. Like Huxley, when he read Darwin's book, he go, oh, why didn't I think of that? It's so obvious. <laughs> exactly. Right. right. But right, right. we didn't. <laughs> so exactly. that's just the way it goes. <laughs> right. All right. Let me uh, wrap this up by reading your final passage in the book, which I really loved. Oh, you know, again, wow. it's, it's uh, you know, just sort of this speculative. You know, it means so much to me that you like my book, by the way, because oh, I'm the, oh, here it is. John fan Joe. of your writing. Thank you. Yes. Well, John Joe McFadden, that's who you referenced in the book. I had him on the yeah. show. He was talking about something completely different, but then we got off on consciousness and he started talking about field. So yes, gave him proper credit for that. Um, right. So you write uh, here in your, you know, the cosmic mind is contained in the local minds, though hidden from our everyday local experiences. What this means for you and me is that our consciousness contains an aspect of the cosmic mind. In Vedic philosophy, this is referred to as the Atman, or the self. This conclusion to some might seem awe-inspiring or preposterous. When I set out to write this book, there is no way I could have imagined presenting this argument. If you find this line of reasoning preposterous, it's even crazier that we came into being to even be able to ponder these questions. Giving a shout-out to the distinguished Indian physicist, who you quoted earlier, no one ever died from theorizing... <laughs> so, congratulations on the book, and go for it. Keep to keep theorizing because who knows, right? That's right. <laughs> There's so many great unanswered questions. Well, I look forward to um, having a cup of coffee in the near future in person and um, and continue the conversation. Yeah, when you come to when you come to California, Southern California, I'll, I'll take you to see Feynman's van. It's pretty cool. We'll take pictures of it, and you can use that as your author photo for your next book. <laughs> I, I will hold you to that. Okay. All right, Stefan, thank you so much.